Hello and welcome. It's your friendly neighborhood narrator, Sue, here. Get cozy as I share with you. Sometimes terrifying, sometimes heartwarming, but always thought provoking encounters of Bigfoot, Dogman, and the straight up paranormal. I post new videos every day, so be sure to like, comment, and subscribe. And with that, let's get right into it. In Monticello, in San Juan County, in Utah, in October of 1959, deer hunters saw a creature around four feet tall with smoky, black, short hair covering its body only 40 feet away. The juvenile Bigfoot then went out of sight into the sagebrush. On to the next one. near Ogden in Weber County in Utah. The sighting took place in Utah in the Wasatch Mountains. I was five years old at the time. My dad was stationed at Hill AFB. All I remember was it was off from Highway 89 going toward the ski resort. One weekend in the spring, my family and two others from the base went on a picnic. We traveled up in the mountains off Highway 89. We were in the Wasatch National Forest going toward the present-day ski areas, only less developed at the time. There was snow on the higher peaks, but a pleasant day. The time was morning, about 9 to 10 a.m. I couldn't wait to play in the mountains. When we arrived at our location, an open area just 100 yards off the road, the adults started setting up the grill and setting up other things. I was with three other children around my age, and we ran off up the side of a large mountain. There we found a small open field and started to play hide and go seek. We were about 200 yards from our parents, and there was no one else around. No cars or other people. The area had a lot of smaller pines and scrub brush. We felt safe where we were. After 20 minutes or so, we went up the mountain a little further and began playing. There was a small mound on the west side where we were playing, and I thought that would be a great spot to hide. As the counting began, I ran around the mound and was trying to hide when I got the feeling I was being watched. I turned around, and about 30 feet from me, standing beside a large tree and bush, was a very large creature. It was just standing there watching me, and I was looking at it. It didn't make any aggressive moves or sounds. It was just content watching me. It had reddish-brown long hair over its body, dark eyes, and fairly tall. I slowly got up and started walking backwards. Our eyes locked on one another. It's like we both were in a trance or something. Some feeling inside of me told me that this was not a safe situation, and that's when I broke off the stair and ran as fast as I could. I ran right past my friends and started screaming all the way down the mountain. When I arrived at the picnic site, I was almost too excited to talk. I ran to my dad and told him what I saw, and he and the other adults agreed that I saw something, but perhaps only a deer or a bobcat. My dad agreed to go back there to check this out. When we got back to the site, we of course found nothing. But later on, as we were leaving the area, I happened to look up at the other part of the mountain we were playing on, and there it was again in the same spot, watching us leave. Before I could say anything, we rounded the corner and lost sight of it. For years after, I was terrified of going into the forest alone. At the time of the incident, there was no one talking about Bigfoot. It was not in the media and really not on the television. I just knew that I saw a strange creature. Years later, I saw a photo or a drawing and it brought back this memory. I believe that this creature was watching us kids play and was very interested in us. At the time, I didn't notice any smell. It was 9 to 10 a.m., clear weather, blue skies, pine forest, and lots of scrub brush in a mountainous area. On to the next one. I was at a family cabin with a friend of mine. 
I was born and raised in Salt Lake, and when we were in junior high middle school, one or the other of our parents would drive us out to our cabin in Cottonwood Canyon, Salt Lake County. One or the other of our parents would drive us up to the family cabin and drop us off for the weekend or a few days, and then the other parents would come pick us up. I'd spent a great deal of time in Big Cottonwood Canyon because of my grandparents' cabin. I went deer hunting regularly with my father when I was younger and later on by myself, so I thought I knew everything there was to know about that canyon. We got dropped off, got settled in, and being 14 or so, there was no drugs or alcohol, no mind-altering anything at all. Just good kids enjoying a little camping trip making us feel grown up. It's hard to describe the feeling of utter isolation. In the summertime, midweek, it was not uncommon to not see a single car or truck for four days on that dirt road. There were no telephones of any kind. We used to go hiking, get up in the mountains, and decide which direction to go, up or down the road. We decided we would go up the road, and it was so hot and so dusty that you couldn't help but see there were a great number of deer tracks heading down the canyon. I mentioned it to my friend, and he said there has always been a lot of deer. But I was like, yeah, but it's summertime, and it's hot, and they normally go higher up in elevation, where they got the creeks, and they shouldn't be going down this low. As we walked along, I looked down at a set of cat tracks, and I said, my God, that's why they're heading down to the canyon. We got a cougar on the prowl. They got the deer moving down the canyon. They're afraid of it. We got up the next morning. We went down the road toward the big cottonwood highway. We used to leave fishing hooks on a line in a creek down the road. We got so absorbed in playing in the creek, we didn't realize it was getting dark. The bats were coming in. We decided to head back toward the canyon. By this time, it was really dark. It was hard to see your hand in front of you. As we go up toward the road, toward the cabin, you could be level with the ground on one side, or you could be staring at a dirt wall on the other side where they cut through the hillside to put in a road. As we walked along, I kept feeling like there was something not quite right, and I said, Dean, stop, just stop. Don't ask me, just stop. I heard a crunch, and whatever made the sound would have been following alongside of us. And when we walked, it walked. And when we stopped, it stopped about one step behind us. I said, Dean, we are being hunted. It's that cougar. And we didn't know exactly what to do. So we kept on walking, and sure enough, you could hear it crunch, crunch, crunch. Some very large animal. And I said, Dean, I think it's a bear. It's just too noisy to be a cougar, and it is after us. Well, we stopped and picked up a good-sized rock on the side of the road and decided if it came out of the darkness towards us, we would throw a rock in its direction and take off. So the two of us are stopped and staring into the darkness. Literally, you could not see nothing but black, and we hear a low, guttural growl. It wasn't feline. It wasn't a bear. It wasn't human. It was just unearthly, and we looked at each other, and we took off running as fast as we could go. The road toward the cabin and the outhouse leveled off. To get from the cabin to the outhouse, you would walk straight out and another 50 yards to the right, and then there was the outhouse. It was right alongside the gully. So, we forfeited the long way on the road and dropped into the gully, ran past, the outhouse ran into the cabin, slammed the door, and locked it. And all of a sudden, you could hear the outhouse door open and slam shut. We were terrified. We flipped on the lights outside the cabin to the outhouse and couldn't see a thing. No movement, no noise. And it dawned on me. A cougar doesn't hide in an outhouse. A bear didn't hide in an outhouse. I had no idea what it was. I had heard of Bigfoot or Yeti, and I knew those, but that's in Tibet and Nepal, and I had no idea there was anything other than the occasional bear or a few cougars. So, we are glued to the window in the cabin, staring at the outhouse. We then got tired of watching, stopped looking out the window, and then you could hear the outhouse door fling itself wide open, 
and whatever it was crashing through the undergrowth. We took our kitchen knives and went upstairs, spent the night staring at the staircase, wondering what was going to stick its head up to scare us to death. We got up the next morning on a beautiful hot day and thought, let's try to salvage this and go the other direction and see what's up that way. So we took off toward Cardiff Mine, a lead and gold mine back in the old days. It got its name from Cardiff, Wales, where the ore was shipped. We had spent so much time hiking on that road, we always took the bridge across the creek and went toward Cardiff Mine, and this time I decided I'd never been to the left of the trail and we ought to give that a shot and see what was interesting up there. So, as we stumbled along, it was pretty thick undergrowth and hard to move through, but we came into a clearing with very ancient old pine and there were six or eight of these pines, and in the middle of them was a pine bed, a circle of pine trees, and it was the one place the sun made it to the ground through the thick canopy. Pine boughs were laid by reaching up and pulling them off and laying them on the ground 12 to 15 feet off the ground, about a 10-foot across circle, so it was no small animal. I couldn't help but notice an immense amount of reddish brown hair everywhere. It was stuck to the bark of the pine trees. It was all over the pine boughs and appeared that there was black scratching where I thought only something bigger and taller than a bear could reach. What was interesting is, as we both stared at this nest, I got a sick feeling. I mean sick to my stomach, like I've never seen anything like this. And I'm really, really afraid, and I'm not sure what I'm afraid of, but I know I gotta get out of here. So we took off. This would have been about two or three miles from the cabin, and I think it was about the next day the parents came and picked us up. The ancient pine trees reminded me of the Lord of the Rings trees. Again, not having any idea that these so-called Bigfoot or Sasquatch or abominable snowmen were real, we went over to my grandmother's house, and I don't know how the discussion got to that point, but I asked her if she's ever seen or heard anything like a Yeti or a Bigfoot. She wrung her hand and said yes. The very first winter she had in 1950, they built the cabin and it was not much of a cabin. It was cinder block and two floors with a bed upstairs. It was in June when the snow melted enough that you could drive up to the cabin. They got out of the car and stared at the cabin and couldn't believe what they were seeing. The door and the door jam was laying flat on the floor in the cabin. There were muddy footprints upstairs and downstairs. Other than that, there was no damage. The door jam and door had to be pounded in. On to the next one. It was in the early fall when my partner Ed and I had hiked into the Otter Tail Range in the hope of scoring a nice elk. After coming up empty, we spent the first night near the base of Fullman Mountain. We regrouped and began our day's hunt hiking towards Allen Peak just to the south of Silver Slope Creek. We had set up on the side of a hill overlooking what appeared to be a well-used game trail and spent the next three hours sitting and waiting. We had seen some decent elk, but nothing to get excited about. At about 1.30, we packed up and started heading towards what we call the Fork, which were two tributaries coming off the southern end of Haskins Creek. Before I continue with what Ed and I found, I have to set the stage for you and your listeners, for if I don't, the story will have no meaning. Several years earlier, my cousin Marilyn had come down with a severe illness. After a battle lasting close to a year, she was told that the end of this life was closing in. She and I were very close, like brother and sister, and she had made a request of me, which was this. At the wake, she wanted me to make sure that I placed her favorite rosary in the casket. It was very unique and beautiful, handcrafted in Italy from onyx stones and silver. The crucifix was backed in silver with an onyx overlay and the corpus of Christ was in silver. The beads on the rosary were not round, as is usually the case, but were rather, in fact, flattened, which is most unusual as it pertains to a rosary. And so it was that Ed and I were working our way 
into the timber in a location where neither of us had ever been. There was evidence here that a fire had taken place perhaps decades earlier, as the sides of many trees were still charred from the flames. As we pressed onward, we came across a dilapidated shack in what appeared to have been, at some point in time, a clearing. The shack having somehow been spared by the fire which had occurred in the area. As we approached the structure, half of the roof had collapsed to the ground, with the side wall having given way to age and decay. Amazingly, the front door frame was still intact, but the left side of the wall, including part of the door's frame, had the appearance of having been torn open in order to widen it. In other words, the damage to this wall, with its appearing ripped open next to and including part of the door's jam, did not seem to be part of the natural process of the shack's overall decay. It looked to us as if it had been done by someone or something, but for what reason we did not know. That was about to change as we peered into this opening. We were confronted with what appeared to be a gigantic nest, a nest that was comprised of twigs, boughs, and leaves, and it covered almost the entire remaining interior of the shack's floor. Some of the pine boughs that this nest was made from were still green, indicating that whatever had placed them there had done so recently. It was an enormous nest, perhaps 15 feet in diameter and 3 feet thick in its construction. It took up the entire interior. You could not enter without walking on top of it. It was virtually at the same time we were looking at the nest that our eyes were drawn to a piece of hot pink fabric in the corner of the shack. Ed was the first to begin navigating his way over the nest. I had followed him, both of us anxious to see what this pink fabric was. We were now standing over the fabric only to realize it was a pair of shorts on the torso of a human body. The appendages were missing. But there was no flesh left on the bones, nor any odor emanating from what was left. This body had been there for a long time. The hair was mostly still on the skull, and some was lying on the floor, being very long, and the decayed remains of a college jersey were clinging on what appeared to be a collapsed ribcage. These were the remains of a young female, without a doubt. I reached down to pick up the pink shorts, and when I did so, a small leather pouch fell out of the pocket onto the floor. It was made of black leather, being about three inches square, with a snap enclosure sealing the top of it. As I now had it in my hand, I opened the snap and pulled out its contents. It was the very same rosary that I had placed inside of Marilyn's casket. A cold chill ran through my body, and Ed could see it in my eyes that something had happened to me when I saw the rosary and held it in my hand. I stepped outside to compose myself, and Ed had followed me, the two of us now standing outside the shack. I began to tell him about my cousin's wake and the meaning that this rosary had to me and her personality. Now, who knows just how many of these rosaries had been created by the artisan, but the fact that I had found one here that was apparently connected with the individual whose remains were in the shack was to me more than coincidental. We had a GPS and marked the coordinates of the location in order to report to the authorities what we had found. When we had made our way out and found ourselves at the police barracks, I handed the rosary to the sergeant and commenced to tell him our story. To Ed and me, this person appeared to have been a jogger, and there was no way in heck that a jogger would be in the wood where we were. The body had been brought there by someone or something, with the question remaining, who or what was it? On to the next one. This happened to me during deer season. I was hunting in the valley between Bolin Lake and Tanner Lake. It must have been around 8 in the morning, and I was wishing the sun would come out as I had been at my chosen spot since six, after tramping through ankle-deep snow, I was sheltered between a pine tree and a rock outcropping when suddenly my dream buck appeared across a shallow gorge. 
I got my shot off and the buck just dropped cold. It didn't move. So I slipped my aught thick over my shoulder, got my bearings and dropped down into the valley between the peaks. I had marked my location carefully as things look different when you change altitude. As you know, it must have taken me about 25 minutes to climb down and across the small valley and up the other side near Tanner Lake. Well, I found the spot, but no deer. There was only a large red stain in the snow and footprints heading toward East Tanner Lake. It looked as if another hunter had got there ahead of me and stole my deer. I was infuriated and I tore through the snow, which was only about eight inches deep on the trail he had left. I was certain that it must have been another hunter, and from the tracks, I assumed he was someone with snowshoes, similar to the short bear paws I had on, since the tracks lacked the trail that the longer snowshoes leave behind their track. I was only 25 years old at the time, and being in good physical shape, I was really moving when I burst through the trees into a small meadow, and there, running through an area of smaller evergreen was my deer. It was on the shoulder of what looked like a big man in a dark fur coat, but without any blaze orange that most deer hunters wear for safety, like what I had on. I was furious, and I unslung my rifle, triggered around into the ground, and yelled out, Hey, drop that deer! That's when I messed myself. The thing turned back toward me and grunted like a bear. It looked like a monster ape, or else the ugliest person I had ever seen, and it shook its arm at me and made kind of a grunt. It seemed to be about eight feet tall and large body. I stopped and just stared, not knowing whether to shoot it or run. The beast made up my mind for me as it made a sort of growl and turned abruptly into the forest, with me simply standing there with my mouth hanging open. I pulled myself together and ran after it. But I had lost precious seconds, and even though I had followed as fast as I could, I finally couldn't even hear it anymore as it outran me. Well, I guess I actually saw a real Sasquatch. On to the next one. I was fishing in a quarry pond, Antrim Lake, in Columbus, in Franklin County, in Ohio. It was around 6 a.m., and the water was calm. Out in the middle of the lake, bubbles started to rise. Then it got more violent, almost like a giant coffee pot percolating. Up burst a huge white thing. It was about 10 feet away. It was out in the lake, and I was sitting on the shore. It swam to the other side of the lake, got up, walked up the bank, and disappeared into the woods. On the other side that bordered the Olentangy River, it seemed quite large, but I didn't realize how big until about a half an hour later, another person showed up and started riding their bicycle around the lake. It had a track. It was about a mile around, but I waited for the bicyclists to get to where the spot where the thing got out of the water, and it was as tall as a man on a bike. So I estimate it at about six feet tall, 250 to 300 pounds, and all white. I have told my wife about this over the years, but she just makes fun of me. I know what I saw, and it was big, white, and came up out of the lake in the very early morning. Maybe it didn't anticipate me being there and swam directly to the other side. I do remember doing some kind of research on Bigfoot in Ohio and read about a report in the Olentangy River around 1943 or so. That's my story. It's true. I noticed just that it had come up out of the lake. It seemed like it was coming up from far down. The bubble started slowly, then almost like it was getting near the surface, almost to a boil. On to the next one. near Monroeville in Jefferson County in Ohio. My wife and I had saddled our horses on this day and we decided to take an afternoon ride on an old trail that we had rode on many times before. The day was bright and clear. While on our way down this trail, I looked to my right and saw a dark shape, just the head, no neck and shoulders. 
At the time, I didn't think too much about it, since many times in the woods while hunting or riding, I have seen shapes that later turned out to be nothing but clumps of branches or leaves. I said nothing to my wife about the shape as we kept riding on. A few minutes later, we passed an old hedgerow on our right. When my wife complained about smelling something terrible that she thought was coming from behind the hedge grove, I just said something must have died and we went on. A few minutes later, we heard this loud, long moaning or wailing sound coming from behind us and to the left. This is a very remote area and no one lives around there for at least a mile and a half. We stopped in our tracks and listened. It seemed to last for 30 seconds or so. We started to talk about what I had seen, what my wife had smelled, and what we had just heard, and started to put two and two together. I believe what we encountered must have been a Bigfoot. I have never told the story to anyone, neither has she. But after reading Bigfoot encounters online, I had to report this to someone. By the way, we went back to the same spot where I had seen this shape, and she had smelled the odor, and both were gone. It was around 2 p.m. The weather was sunny and clear. It was thick forest, very rugged, with many hedgerows and overgrown fields. As far as we know, no other incidents were ever reported. But it has taken many years for us to report this. This is one of the most remote areas of the state. Our horses didn't even react to anything. On to the next one. near Oberlin in Lorien County in Ohio. I was 17 years old and was out deer hunting with my bow and arrows. It was just starting to get dark out when I heard something moving about 200 yards away in the pine trees. A couple of minutes later, I heard three deep grunts. At first, I thought it was maybe a big buck grunting for a doe, but the more it kept grunting, the more I thought it was maybe a rabid dog. It was making a lot of noise as it came closer to the opening to cross to the other side of the pine trees. It stopped just a few feet from the opening to the path. It just didn't feel right, so I didn't even draw my bow. I remember grabbing my knife for protection. I was in a tree stand, but kept thinking the rabid dog would bay me in a tree. After what seemed like forever, I heard the most blood-curdling scream as it jumped across the open path and into the other pine trees. All I remember was saying to myself, Oh my God, it was on two legs. It took only three jumps to cross 20 feet. It was starting to get dark and was about 50 feet from me, so I couldn't tell the color or features. All I remember was that it was big and only on two legs. It kept screaming like a bobcat scream or a little child scream and was running so fast into a big wooded area. I jumped from the tree and ran back to my house with tears in my eyes. My parents weren't home, so I ran to our neighbor's house and called him to his back porch. He heard the screaming and the animal breaking wood in the woods. He told me he has never heard anything like that ever. My parents ended up not believing me. It was about a half an hour before sunset. This was a cut through path between about 10,000 pine trees, about a 20 foot wide path. There was a wooded area behind me with a creek running through it. The only witnesses was my nearest neighbor who only heard the animal screaming and moving through the wooded area where it ran to. About three years ago, I met someone who lived in Lodi, Ohio. He said his family saw Bigfoot. I'm not sure about the time frame but I think it was around the same time. There were numerous Bigfoot sightings in Caution County. On to the next one. In Koshkaton County in Ohio, a footprint that was 11 and a half inches long, six inches at the ball, and three inches at the heel was discovered on a sandbar and cast. The cast indicated that the depth of the foot at the ball was two inches and the depth at the heel was one inch. The witnesses were ginseng hunting. Four toes can be made out on the cast. The sighting was in a wooded area. The creature was apparently walking along and had to cross a creek. It happened to step on a sandbar, which was no more than two by three feet. It left another partial print and then stepped back 
onto solid ground. On to the next one. Back in the 1970s, a man named James Vincent of Hendersonville, Kentucky, was out hunting for a large man-like creature covered with white hair, which left behind 15-inch footprints and a terrible smell in Black Hollow near Bethpage, Kentucky. The area has a long history of Bigfoot sightings, and the creatures are known locally as wild woolly bullies. The hunt was apparently highly unsuccessful. The first American oil well was struck in Cumberland County, Kentucky, just three miles north of Burkeville in 1829. It was also the first location in America to elect a female sheriff. On to the next one. I am very excited to announce that on this channel we are offering membership. Now, I never want my subscribers to feel like I am paywalling content, so new videos will remain 100% completely free. The membership is a way for those who feel like they want to support me to do so and help the channel grow monetarily. What your membership gives you access, though, to are subscriber badges, which evolve with how long you've been a member, and you can watch your badge grow from a baby Bigfoot all the way up to a sage Bigfoot. Also, as a member, you'll get access to member-only emojis, which are these beautiful Bigfoot emojis. Again, I never want to paywall any content on this channel. I always want the content to be free because I love the community and I want you to enjoy your time here. But if you do wish to support me making this content, this membership is a way for you to do that. Thanks for listening, and on to the next one. Davies County, Kentucky, in the western part of the state, has a long history of monster activity as well. According to the Owensboro Messenger Inquirer, in 1978, residents of the 2800 block of Fairview Drive reported that they had witnessed a huge dark-colored monster on several occasions, apparently observing them from the concealment of the nearby woods. It was eight to ten feet tall, they claimed, and four to five feet wide at the shoulders, a truly massive creature. It usually appeared in the evening hours and was said to smell like rotting corpses or death. Tracks were found which measured 14 to 16 inches long and six to seven inches wide. Evidently, the authorities were unable to offer any further help, so a neighborhood posse was formed to rid the area of the gigantic malodorous menace. The posse consisted of a man named Larry Nelson, his brother, and two friends. They were well-armed, of course. The hunt for the beast was successful, and they came upon it by the bank of an old pond where they reportedly fired at it repeatedly with forty-five caliber rifles, from close range. Miraculously unscathed, the thing ran away into the woods, leaving no blood trail at all. Only an odd wet spot where the beast had stood. Several Owensboro motorists allegedly caught the creature in their headlights. More recently, 17-year-old Josh claimed that he saw Bigfoot in Davies County, just outside of Owensboro. It was about 3.30 in the afternoon when... I was on the northwest end of Bond Harbor Hills, where a lot of coal mines used to be, and some entrances to these are still open in places deep in the woods. Me and my dad were checking out a dam that my uncle was enlarging next to a small pond. My dad had walked back down to a vegetable garden that my uncle and his son were growing, so he didn't experience it. I could feel a presence looming over me up the ridge about 100 feet away. I stepped into the woods and immediately knew I was out of bounds, literally. I was right next to a teepee-type structure that I had read about as being possible Bigfoot boundary markers. I began studying it when, wham, out of nowhere, this five to seven pound rock grazes my ear and knocks the teepee over. I was frozen where I stood. I looked in the direction from where the rock came from. I didn't see it at first, but... 
Then I saw about a seven to nine foot tall, large shadow jump from behind a big oak tree at the top of the ridge. It took off going down the other side of the ridge, and I took off in the other direction back to my vehicle. A few months prior to the encounter, the witness was in the same general area when he heard a very loud, blood-chilling scream emanating from a thickly wooded ravine. The scream was followed by a horde of forest animals fleeing the area fast. A local Bigfoot investigator interviewed the 17-year-old witness and found him to be credible. He added that the witness claimed to have conducted a search for trace evidence and found some large impressions which he felt were possible footprints of the creature. Interestingly, in late fall, one woman claimed that she and her boyfriend had been in the backwoods of the Bon Harbor area in the winter and come across something very unusual. Her boyfriend was a county surveyor and his job often put him in spots that were well off the beaten path. On this day, there was snow on the ground and it was very cold. When they arrived, they found a huge human-looking footprint impressed deeply into the snow. It looked like a bare human footprint, she said, only it was about two feet long and about eight inches wide. She also remarked that she could clearly see the impressions of huge toenails that dug into the snow. She didn't know what to think, but the prince scared the heck out of her boyfriend. She said, who insisted that they leave the area immediately. Just a few miles down the road in Henderson, Kentucky, near the Davies County line, comes this story from a woman whom I'll call Molly as she wishes to remain anonymous about her experience she had as a child at a place called Hurricane Slough. My dad was an engineer and a land surveyor in Davies County, Molly said. He knows a lot about the backwoods in the area from Stanley through West Louisville and spent time on his property as a child. But he's not the type to believe this story. He sees things as being very black and white. One side of my family has lived in this area since at least the 1870s. I was about four years old and with my dad. I was the oldest child and he always took me for rides in the red pickup truck. We were out in the country to look at our projects. My great-grandmother was still alive and she had several pieces of property in the Stanley Sorgo area. My dad was the oldest grandchild and managed the property upkeep. This particular piece of land had been in my family for four generations. It doesn't have a house or buildings on it, but rather was used for crops. My grandfather and great-grandfather farmed it, but now we paid a neighboring farmer to plant and harvest for us. On this day, we were not near the frontage road. We were deeper back on the property, not too far from the Green River. In the front of the property, there is actually a jack pump, a pump well for crude oil. From the main road, you turn onto a dirt road with cuts through the middle of the property and ends at the Green River. We drove back past some fields to a big drainage ditch or creek about three quarters the way to the river. There were more trees around this ditch back then in the mid 1970s. It's been cut way back since then to keep clear for flooding. Past the ditch, there's another small strip of farmland fields it floods often, and then a thin tree line on the Green River. I was playing on a picnic blanket on the far side of that ditch while my dad looked to see if the beavers had dammed up the ditch. He was clearing away some brush and looking at the water flow. He's a civil engineer, and probably about five years later, he put in a big drainage pipe with a dirt bridge across it on this property. He was probably at least 250 yards from me on the other side of the ditch and down into it. I was playing near our pickup truck. I was a very precocious blonde haired kid and was singing to my stuffed animal and playing tea party. There are a ton of wild vines on the trees in this area, overgrown on the tree trunks in a thicket. It's almost like kudzu, but not very leafy. I guess it might be honeysuckle, poison ivy, or similar. I like the little tunnels and caves in the vines and had been playing in those previously. I felt like something was watching me, not from where my dad was, but in the other direction. In the little stand of trees, maybe 50 feet away, I felt like I could hear it, 
but it made no sound. I just felt its presence very strongly. I looked and could only see its legs, which were huge and very hairy, dark brown. I thought they were part of the tree trunks at first. I guess I could sort of see a vague outline of its torso to perceive its full size, but I never saw a face or a head. Mostly, I just saw the legs very clearly. I got up, still looking at it, backed away a couple of steps, and ran towards my dad. I was startled, but not extremely frightened. I didn't really feel like it was going to get me or chase me. I felt like it was observing me. But I ran because it was startling, and I felt obligated to tell my dad there was something there with us, and it was big, and dad needs to know about those things. When I looked back after I ran about 10 strides, it had totally disappeared. If it had run toward the river, it would have still been visible in the cleared fields. If it had gone towards the ditch, it would have passed me. I remember thinking it might have gone into the tree trunk and vine somehow. I ran to my dad and told him I saw a gorilla man. He could not understand what I meant. He went over and looked in the area, but didn't see anything at all. When we got home, he told me to tell my mom about it. I kept saying it was big like a gorilla, but standing up like a man and taller than dad, who was six foot two. Even though Molly has since grown up and moved away to a big city, and her family eventually sold the property, she said she would always remember that day when she was a child and how it felt to actually see something so startling, so wild, and completely unknown. It has always puzzled her to no end, however, how such a large animal could completely disappear from view so quickly. To such an extent, she has come to the realization that the creature she saw must have been supernatural in nature in order to pull off this vanishing act. On to the next one. In Erie County, Pennsylvania, the sighting was on a dirt path on a campground less than one mile south of Lake Erie. Working as a volunteer at the camp, I was with several campers at a site. Two of the campers began walking down a path away from the campsite, and I was forced to go after them. After walking approximately 60 yards from the campsite, the path bended from the campsite, giving us minimal light from the campfire. One of the campers ducked behind a tree, and the other crouched in the path about five feet in front of me. I told the one behind the tree to come over to me, which he did. I was about to tell the second camper to get up and come over to me when the creature strolled across the path. It was approximately seven and a half feet tall and slim. It was about ten feet further than the camper away from me. Losing sight of the creature due to the dark and the trees, I turned to the camper beside me and asked, Did you see that? When I was asking the first camper, the second camper on the ground said, There it is again. I personally did not see it the second time. The camper beside me said he didn't see anything, and I wrote the incident off as another staffer strolling the camp. The next day, I did further investigating, looking for footprints, etc., to see if I could see who was roaming around. There were no signs. I must admit, I put a little effort in looking, though. I asked my co-counselor, Ted, if he had been roaming about, or if he knew who had. Ted said he was at the lodge at the time that everybody was in bed. The non-counseling staff stay in a lodge and another cabin, and that it wasn't him. Upon hearing this, I then thought about the possibility of a Sasquatch. After this incident, I have regained my interest in cryptozoology as a hobby, which is limited since I now attend art school in downtown Pittsburgh. The only witnesses were the two campers and myself the trail runs along a ridge with a swamp which becomes a pond further down the trail. On the north side and more swamp which is not as thick on the south side, fairly thick trees run the sides of the ridges. On to the next one. In Somerset County in Pennsylvania, the area was in the Laurel Mountains. There are a few ski resorts, some are closed down, retreat cabins and very thick woods with many back roads. It is a very hilly and wooded area. I was counseling at a summer wilderness camp one summer after college 
and was up late one night talking with two campers and a co-counselor. We were sitting in the middle of a dead-end road surrounded by a small farmer's field, a small lake, and very thick woods and hills. We heard a horrible screaming coming from the woods next to the field, about 50 feet away. We all jumped up and immediately shined our flashlight in the direction of the sound, but did not see anything. The night was too dark and our beams too dim. The girls got scared and ran into the cabin to hide. My co-counselor and I stood outside for about half an hour listening to the screams, which came at intervals throughout the entire time. I've never heard anything like it. It sounded like something screaming in death. I cannot describe it. It was a very large sound. I am an outdoors person, and I know the sounds that most animals make, and I had never heard anything like that before, and had never heard anything since, until I was browsing around, looking at Bigfoot reports, and discovered some audio recordings. What I heard sounded exactly like what I heard that night. What I heard online sounded exactly like what I heard that night. I listened to it over and over again to be sure it was the same sound, and although I am not certain what it was that we heard that night, it certainly is the same scream. We heard it for only about half an hour that night. There were no answering screams. I heard a similar scream about a week later from a distance away. This time, I was alone. I heard the same screaming when I was by myself about a week later, although it was further off. There were no return screams or howls. There were four witnesses to the original screaming. Myself, 24 at the time, another 22-year-old adult, and two teenage girls, 15 and 17 at the time. We were talking and sitting on the dirt road. It was 11 midnight, somewhere in there. The night was very dark. I don't recall a moon, but it was clear with no clouds. The area is hilly and wooded with many mountain laurels and deciduous trees. There was also quite a bit of farmland speckled throughout the area. With many dairy cows, hay, and cornfields, there was a small lake with a dead-end road with no houses. Just the wilderness camp with cabins and camp buildings and equipment. On to the next one. In Shippensburg in Cumberland and Franklin counties in Pennsylvania, a night delivery service driver was driving in a rural area when he noticed something bright in the middle of the road. He immediately slowed down. It was two big, bright yellow eyes. At first, he thought it was an animal, but then it was right in front of the car about a foot away. The creature stood about five feet tall. It was black and very skinny with extremely long arms and a very big head with bright yellow eyes. It stared right at the witness through the front windshield for about five seconds, then turned to the driver's side window and stared at him for five more seconds. It then turned and waved its arm as if it was signaling for the witness to leave. He started driving away. As he was leaving, he heard a loud rush of air. Terrified, he did not go back. On to the next one. Northeast of Mason Town, a man was coming home when he had to stop the car to urinate. He got out of his car and saw something on all fours. It was really dark on the road, and he thought that it was a deer. The man stood there for a second, and then the deer stood up on two legs and made a loud noise like he had never heard before. He jumped to his car, and since it was standing in the direction that he was pointing, he had a full view of it. It was seven to eight feet tall and had red eyes. The witness bleeped the car horn and made a screaming noise and ran across the woods into the trees. It had brown hair covering its body. He got home and told his mother, who said there had been reports in the woods. On to the next one. I was living with my new bride, Tessa, in western Pennsylvania. At that time, there was a long-standing debate going on within the state between those who do and those who don't. Please allow me to explain. At that time, we had a fairly robust black bear population in the state, with the do's being those who were in favor of more black bears 
such as hunters and tourists, and the don'ts being farmers and beekeepers, such as myself, along with a whole host of other agricultural-related businesses. Black bears can be extremely destructive creatures, and as you can imagine, bears have an insatiable hankering for honey. Perhaps you may recall the story of Winnie the Pooh and his liking for honey, the author apparently having a certain knowledge pertaining to the habits of bears prior to writing the book. Beekeeping was not all that I did, but it had grown from a hobby into producing about 20% of my income at the time, and I wasn't too keen on having anyone or anything lousy that up. I had been living in this house for three years alone, with my wife having been with me for the last two years that led up to the event of which I'm about to tell you. Although I just told you that bears are a problem for the honey industry, I hadn't personally had a problem with them, but I knew others within the state who had through our organizational newsletter. It was well known in our town that an occasional bear was shot and buried in a ditch to protect one's hive from destruction. In our neck of the woods, it was not uncommon to hear a gunshot ring out at any time of the year and no one was particularly running to find out where it had come from. I went out to the hives early one morning to begin a clean out. I had suited myself up and got my smoke pot going. I had eight large hives located in three different areas of the field behind my house. My new bride was already getting her feet wet, helping me with the bees. Behind my house was what my wife called the dollhouse, which was a shed I built to look like our house. It was the same color and had the same green roof shingles. It had a couple of double hung windows as well. In reality, it was the shop I used to extract honey from the combs, and I had taken the time to make it look like something other than a shed. Having taken the combs from the first two sets, my wife was already hard at work in the dollhouse. So, I went out into the far end of the field to tend to the rest of the hive. As I was approaching the last set out in the field, I could see there were bees flying everywhere and that the tops had been removed from the hive. As I got nearer, most of the combs were scattered around on the ground. Upon closer inspection, they and the hive themselves had been badly damaged. Of course, my initial thoughts were that now I was the one with a bear problem and I was going to have to do something about it. I spent the rest of the morning repairing the hive, after which I focused my energy on the solution. For whatever reason, my thoughts were that the bear would come back to the same hives, having been repaired, and so I lashed a ladder to the side of a large maple near the hives and nailed some 2 by 12s in the crotch of the tree as a place to sit and wait for a culprit to return. That night, I took my double barrel 12, loaded with buckshot, and sat in the tree the entire night with nothing coming of it. After talking it over with my wife, I decided to wait a few days and have a go at it again. Four days later, I once again climbed up into the tree to lay in wait for the honey snatcher's return. I had climbed up into the tree at 10 p.m., bringing with me my shotgun and a large flashlight with four D-cells that I had taped to the underside of the gun's barrel. It wasn't like you had to aim this gun because at close range, it would be more or less a point-and-shoot scenario. It was highly doubtful that I could or would miss anything at that distance I was sitting away from the hive. At 2 a.m. on the button, I heard some crunching in the edge of the woods, and I began seeing the silhouette of something large and black coming into the field. Although I could see no details whatsoever because the flashlight was still off, it looked like the biggest bear in the state of Pennsylvania was now walking over to my hive. I waited until it was on top of them, and removing the lid from one of the hives, that's when I threw the switch on the flashlight, illuminating it, and I pulled the trigger before it or I had a chance to think. It was only a split second after the shot had hit it, that I realized it was not a bear, but a giant gorilla. It reeled backward from the impact and fell to the ground. I had the light on it, and it stood to its feet yet again. 
So frightened was I by the sight of this creature that, without hesitation, I squeezed off the second barrel, hitting the beast squarely a second time. Again, the monster fell to the ground, and I broke the barrel frantically to load two more shells. With my adrenaline pumping, and in my haste to reload quickly, the heavy flashlight broke free from the tape as I snapped the barrels open. It fell to the ground below the tree, and the light went out. I was now sitting in the tree, alone in the dark, with a gigantic wounded beast twenty yards away from me in the field. It took my eyes a little while to refocus without the aid of the light, and when they did, I couldn't see the gorilla anymore. It was gone. Now, there was no way I was climbing down out of the tree with no light and that beast walking around wounded. So, I decided to stay in the tree. About thirty minutes later, I saw light coming across the field from my house, and I knew it was my wife. Of course, she'd heard the shots and was expecting me to return, which I hadn't. I screamed at the top of my lungs, Get back in the house and lock the doors! I saw the light turn around, and I knew that she had heard me and was running back toward the house. What I didn't know was that she had called the police. About fifteen minutes later, I could see flashing lights down by the house. Within moments, there were several men shouting and coming into the field with flashlights. I shouted to them, I'm over here in the large maple. Be careful, there's a large wounded animal around here somewhere. With that, their pace slowed and the lights were now moving everywhere in the field. By the time they got close to me, I was already coming down the ladder and beginning to tell them what had happened. We all looked at the hive and there was quite a bit of blood on the ground where the gorilla had twice fallen. We all walked back to the house where my wife was waiting, and we sat down in the kitchen where I had a lot of explaining to do. When I got around to telling everyone about the gorilla, you can just imagine the looks I was getting. One of the officers said, it's against the law to hunt bears out of season, regardless of what they are doing to your hives. I tried to lighten things up by saying, what about shooting a gorilla? But they weren't smiling. In the morning, they had returned to scour the woods in hopes of finding what they believed would be a bear, but nothing was found. They told me that if I was found in violation in the future, they would find me and confiscate my gun, and they left. After they were gone, my wife said to me, Honey, did you really shoot a gorilla? I told her that what I had seen was indescribable in known human terms. It was definitely not a man, but it was way too big to be a gorilla. And yet, at the time, the description favored that of being a gorilla rather than that of being a man. When I had raised the barrels of my shotgun and flipped the switch on the flashlight, there was approximately a three-second delay before I squeezed the trigger. This was enough time for my mind to determine human or not human, and then I fired the shot. When the light hit it, the eyes were glowing bright yellow, and the beast opened its mouth, exposing large white teeth. The top of its head was almost level with the board I was sitting on, the height being close to ten feet. It had to be all of five or six feet wide at the shoulders, and its musculature was beyond description. When I hit it with the first round, and that followed by the second, the beast didn't make so much as a sound. There was no scream or growl or anything. It was knocked down and got up, and it was knocked down again and then it disappeared as I was reloading. I now know that what I shot was a Bigfoot. However, at the time, I had not personally heard of any of the then-reported sightings and evidence that had been seen in the Pacific Northwest in regard to the Patterson-Gimlin film or the large footprints which were found on that job site. None of this was known to me at the time. After the creature was shot that night, there was no further damage done to the hives going forward. I never saw any further evidence of the Bigfoot's presence on our property, and my wife and I continued to live at that home for another 15 years after the events of that night. On to the next one. My folks own property near the Applegate Lake in Southern Oregon, and although Dad always planned to build a summer cabin there, 
It seems that the closest any of the family ever came was taking a truck camper or travel trailer out to the place for a week or so at a time. My brothers and I have been taking turns enjoying the solitude of the beautiful forest, and a couple of times each year we've been gathering to have a family reunion at the place. We're near the dam, but our property is not right on the lake, so we generally just take a boat or two with us when we go. It's ironic that just a couple of miles from our property is the place where they built that large Bigfoot trap on Collins Mountain. I guess it was built back in the 1970s. Well, anyway, somebody must have seen a Bigfoot again because some people were up on that mountain searching for it. They came out of the woods behind our property and asked permission to cut back to the main road so they could get back to the campground where they were staying. They said they found some big tracks, but that was all. I didn't mention our experiences because we don't need a bunch of strangers tramping around in our forest. Anyway, about six months ago, we were making a routine check on the property to make sure our gate was still secure and that nobody had messed with the two aluminum boats we kept under the lean-to where our firewood is under tarp. There was still snow in the woods, so we left our rig parked at the gate and walked in so we wouldn't tear up our road with muddy ruts. We weren't over a block in when we saw the tracks. At first, we thought it had been a trespasser, but one of the prints was very clear on the road, and it wasn't human. Both my brother and I thought it might be a bear at first, but the tracks were too long, and besides, bear should have still been in hibernation. These tracks were like a human giant with bare feet. The prints disappeared into the high grass, so the only ones we could measure were the ones on the road. They were almost twice the size of my 5'11 boot. When we got to the sheltered area where the boats were, we saw more tracks that cut back around our lean-to and right behind the shed was a dead deer, a small doe that was torn in pieces. There wasn't much meat left, but there was hide and hair all over and a huge gut pile and blood all over the snow and there were those big tracks again all over the area. Some of the tracks were smaller, but they were still as big as my boot print. It was like a couple of animals had killed the deer and then ripped her apart and made a huge mess. We left the gore there, figuring coyotes or other critters would clean it up, and we left. Just as we got back to our pickup, a forestry truck came by, and we flagged the driver down. It was a ranger that we were acquainted with, and we told him what happened. He wanted to see the spot, so back and we went. He said several of the neighboring properties had seen a large animal back up in the hills that they say resembled a huge bear walking slumped over on its hind leg. He said their department put out notice to the staff that these incidents were not to be discussed because they didn't want a bunch of armed nutcases running around shooting at shadows. Supposedly, they had more report from full-time residents in the area of some bear-like animal doing damage and even reports of missing and dead dogs. We had an abnormally cold and long winter, so they felt whatever it was must have run out of its normal food source. He took us to his truck, and there, under a tarp, were the remains of a bobcat, and it looked like it had been ripped in half. He was taking it back to the Applegate office for more careful analysis. It's very hard to get any of the BLM or forestry people to admit that this thing exists but yet they all seem to be aware of it. What are they so afraid of? Well, we keep hearing the same report. I guess they can't just afford to acknowledge the information due to too heavy of a workload. I have a feeling that the government knows more than they would ever admit to. I hope you enjoyed those encounters. And if you did, be sure to hit that like button, leave a comment, and subscribe. I post new content every single day, so be sure to hit that notification bell and you'll be notified exactly when that new content arrives on my channel. Again, thank you so much and until next time, bye!